back. We'll go to. Uh, We'll go Sorry, to. Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm here, Mr. Chair. Okay, there you are. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Michael. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, ask a few questions uh, in relation to the first time home buyer uh, incentive yeah. uh, program. When uh, that program was launched uh, about uh, a year ago, it was estimated that it would help uh, 100,000 Canadians purchase a, a home. Is, is that correct? It was estimated that it would help up to 100,000 Canadians. Up to 100,000. And it was also estimated that in the first six months uh, that uh, there would be 20,000 approvals. Is that correct? It was estimated that there would be up to. In fact, in my testimony at this committee in response to a question last May, I said that the maximum recipient number was 39,000 per year and that over two and a half years, 100,000 would therefore be an upper limit. 39,000 per year. Per year. That's As, the number of people to whom it would apply, not those who would apply, but to whom it could apply. And thus far, uh, we haven't seen 39,000. We haven't seen 20,000. We've seen 2950. Is that correct? That is also correct. Well, actually, that's uh, no, there's an updated number. So I'll get you the updated number, but keep keep going and I'll get you the updated number. Sure. That number, well, I think, was as of the end of 2019. Yeah. Well, that just strikes me as being very much on the low end. I mean, no one was talking about uh, 2950 uh, a year ago or, or six months ago. So I was just wondering if you can, can explain why so few uh, Canadians have benefited from this program. Uh, the answer is, uh, so that program was designed as an alternative to easing the stress test or increasing amortizations, both of which would have involved more borrowing and an easing of credit standards that would have aggravated already high levels of household debt. So the reason this hasn't been taken on is probably a combination of either lack of demand because those people are already well enough supported and that those who said they needed more and there was a crisis on our hands were not factual. Um, uh, or they had a view that house prices were going to go up and they didn't want to share it as opposed to house prices going down and those motivations would change. Yeah, so clearly it's, it's a program that is not working, but Canadian taxpayers are on the hook for $1.25 billion to date, right? Uh, no, taxpayers are only on the hook for what's actually been spent. Yeah. They're not yeah. on the hook for $1.25 no. billion. No, dollars. but that the committed $1.25 billion. Yes. It's $115 million yeah. so far, 6,000 participants as of our current numbers. Right. 6,300 6, right. applications. Right. right, yes. Now, uh, uh, I want to just turn to, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that there could be as many as uh, one-fifth of mortgages that could be in arrears. Did I hear you correct? They could get there by September if by September. this continues. Yeah, it's right now it's 12%, sir. 12%. Okay. And that's, that's a staggering uh, increase. Uh, now, uh, just to clarify in terms of some of the numbers, but I think you did provide an answer to uh, Mr. Polly later on. Uh, did, did you say, uh, I think you provided a figure as to how much CMHC uh, could stand to lose as a result of mortgage defaults. Did you provide a figure to that question? I said that our stress testing, which yeah. is uh, of a, the uh, stress beyond the current environment, we could lose up to $9 billion. $9 billion. That's what I heard yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Polyev, do you want to wrap up? Uh, Pierre, are you there? Yes. Uh, how much time do we have? You've got a minute and a half. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as you know, under the Basel uh, agreements, uh, Canadian banks, uh, like other international counterparts, have to create keep a certain buffer of uh, liquid assets on hand. Yeah. Uh, I understand that banks have been selling you their mortgages and then buying them back and then claiming that those repurchased and now government-backed mortgages are the account as their um, liquid assets. Is that the case? That is, and they pay a fee for that, sir. But do you think that that is consistent with what we intend when we require, for regulatory reasons, a bank have a buffer? Um, one, I, I typically think of that as being cash or highly liquid treasuries. Um, and, you know, it, it just seems like a bit of an accounting trick that the bank would send those mortgages over to you. You'd give them a stamp, send them back, and then they claim that those are their liquid uh, assets counting towards their buffer. You know, I, I, I'm not a banker or um, an, an accountant, but it does seem 
like it's not in keeping with the regulatory purpose of that policy. Yeah, and we want them to uh, insure mortgages for the purpose of securitizing, as I think you would remember. Uh, and so we are monitoring that activity right now. Uh, we, we assume that what's happening is an adjustment period and that what we're seeing is temporary. But as you would know, within the OSFI rules and the Basel rules, converting a credit from a person's mortgage credit to a government credit, which is what an insurance policy does, yeah. makes it more credit worthy. Yeah, that is true. That is true. And the taxpayers backing it up. Concluding, uh, um, you know, one alternative, as I mentioned, my opening remark would be to move towards covered bonds, uh, where, you know, instead of having a taxpayer backing for all of this debt, the debt would be backed up by uh, a strong and even excessive uh, collateral. Um, widely practiced in Europe. In Canada, it only represents 9% of Canadian mortgages. And according to a report by the Bank of Canada, um, the reason for this, and I'm going to quote, is, is instead, banks have been relying primarily on cheap government-guaranteed mortgage funding options. Is it possible that CMHC and the backing of Canada Guarantee and Genworth by the government is actually pushing out this market mechanism that could give us a secure um, a form of uh, backing up our mortgages without putting the liability on the backs of taxpayers? Well, we're careful, uh, Chair, in response to the question. We are very careful to make sure, with the benefit of private competitors, that this is being priced in a market way. Um, we, we actually charge significant premiums, and that's the result of uh, the, the reason we've returned $17 billion to the federal government over the last 10 years. Um, it's, it's a market function. It's a commercial function. Okay, we'll have to end it there. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion. Learned something there too. <laughs> uh, we'll go to uh, Ms. Katrakis, uh, and then a single question from Ms. May and a single question from uh, Ms. Zerowitz. Ms. Katrakis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sadal and Ms. Bowers for this uh, most interesting um, discussion this afternoon. I'm going to go back to the CICRA. Um, I've heard from many small businesses in my writing where a lot of the landlords, uh, as many of us have said this afternoon, are not participating in this uh, very important program. Uh, in fact, I've heard that some landlords are saying that uh, they have been advised by their lawyers not to participate in this program. <laughs> Why do you think this is? Um self-serving misinformation frankly uh the, the, it's it's not a smart thing to do it's going to cost them more money and i don't know if people think they can negotiate a program with us but that's not the way the world works um <coughs> is there anything that we can do to avoid or counter this advice when we will be publishing information on our website we will make sure it gets to uh to all members <coughs> forgive me excuse me and uh, please share that widely I will. and we will of course promote it on social media and then moving forward with our new reality, which is Zoom meetings and working from home, uh, with many uh, employees currently finding success from working from home, there has been some speculation uh, that businesses may choose to maintain a work from home policy even when after the pandemic has passed. Um, in your opinion, can we expect a decline in the number of businesses deciding to rent or uh, purchase physical workspaces? Well, that would require conjecture. Um, I will tell you that at CMHC, before this crisis, as a result of investments we made in IT and in mobility for our employees, and also to make them to, to give them the opportunity to work closer with their clients, we did have a reduced footprint of folks at the office, and we were compressing from four buildings to one. That's our experience. It seems to me that there could be a reduced demand for office space, especially as people try to protect their health in the near term. Right. And do you think that this is an issue that may need to be addressed through federal policy or or not? Well, I, I think it's a uh, I, I'm, I'm probably outside of my territory here, but um, you, we'd be the government standing in front of economic forces tends to be a battle that's hard to fight. Yeah, I hear we, you. we tend to address market dislocations and we do that pretty effectively or market failures that may not be in the category of market failure. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have 
Is that it, uh, Annie? That's it for me. I don't have a okay. short Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. I've uh, seen uh, Miss Bowers uh, really smile when you said you're outside your territory there. Oh, she should, <laughs> she should jump in. <laughs> uh, Romy, did you have any further comments? Uh, did you want to add anything <laughs> there, Romy? Uh, no, I, I, won't that venture, I won't venture into that territory. So <laughs> okay, I, I think good. you have an excellent response. All right, uh, we'll go with you, uh, Miss May, and then uh, Julie has one to uh, finish up. Okay, yes, I'm not going to try to sneak in two for one, but it's very tempting. I just Go wondered, we, we've talked about the densification, the way forward, modular housing. I wonder if you have any comments on co-op housing and CMHG's interest in co-op housing and co-housing models as a way to get more people into their own homes. Yeah, we, are, you know, we support a number of uh, cooperative housing, a, a huge number of uh, cooperative housing ventures and uh, the... Um, uh, the Cooperative Housing Federation is a, a key partner with us in, in doing uh, housing in Canada. Co-housing is something we've actually looked at as an innovative form of housing as, as a way to go. Um, and we're looking at what we can do to help pursue research in that area. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Ms. Sirowitz, you had a follow-up. Yes, I just had one quick question. I know you had mentioned, Mr. Siddell, that uh, you do not expect the loss uh, the the loss to be very high around sort of mortgage defaults. Yeah. To what extent was the new mortgage rules that we've put into place over the last few years a factor in the fact that we will be minimizing um, that long. Oh, goodness. I, if I had a plant a question, that would have been it. And I promise <laughs> everybody else here that was not a plant. In fact, I was going to say it in response to a question from Mr. Polyev, because, and, and his questions are so apt because, of course, he was well briefed when he was the minister responsible for CMHC. Um, but uh, had we not imposed the stress test, we would have had higher deferrals and we would have had more people not paying their mortgages and we would have had more foreclosures. That is certainly the case. Um, and, and that has been the result. Great. Thank okay, you. Okay, that's a uh, a positive uh, note to uh, to end on. We had to take some time to introduce. I think seven witnesses. This is the next uh, uh, panel. Look, I, I want to thank you uh, you Chairman. both for what. Uh, go ahead. As a Here? vice chair, I just want to jump in briefly. I want to say thank you to the the president. Uh, I have to say this: it is so refreshing to have a witness who comes and gives clear, factual answers. We might not agree on everything, but he knows his stuff and he answers the damn question, which is really refreshing for us who are asking those questions. Pierre, I can't, I can't believe uh, this. You and I practically were going to say the same thing before you interrupted me. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I was going to say uh, thank you both for what I feel was a, a very uh, frank uh, and open discussion with, uh, with very clear cut, uh, cut answers. So thank you both for that. And I also, Thank you also for the uh, service that CMHC provides the uh, uh, the, the the country at uh, this time when it's much needed. So thank you both for your presentations. Thank you very much for inviting me. And Romy, thank you for making sure I didn't screw it all up. <laughs> thank you very much. It's okay, guys, we will, uh, we'll suspend uh, for uh, about uh, three minutes uh, and then be on to the next panel. The meeting suspended. <laughs>